Achoo! Oh, my mom told me about this. That's Grandpa's friend, Frank. Manzanar was a prison camp in California. In 1942, more than 10,000 Japanese Americans were forced to move there. Dear Tim and Moby, I am a fifth generation Japanese American and my ancestors were imprisoned during World War II. Can you make a movie about what happened? From Mia. Sure, Mia. World War II started in 1939. On one side, you had the Allies, Britain, France, and later the Soviet Union. They were fighting the Axis powers, Germany, Italy, and Japan. But the U.S. stayed on the sidelines. That is, until December 7, 1941, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The U.S. joined the Allies and entered the war. Soon afterwards, more than 110,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up and sent to one of ten prison camps scattered across the country. There were no trials. They weren't accused of a crime. They were given just a few days to pack and could only bring what they could carry. Their new homes were flimsy sheds with no insulation and little furniture. They were kept there for up to four years. The bombing of Pearl Harbor had caught U.S. defenses completely by surprise. Military leaders had thought an attack like that was impossible. Some of them believed that Japanese Americans in Hawaii must have helped. Generals wondered what else they might be missing and if more attacks were in the works. They suggested it was only a matter of time before Japan invaded the West Coast. They warned that the Japanese Americans living there could be a fifth column. Locals who were secretly loyal to the enemy just waiting to undermine their country from within. Military leaders said that removing Japanese Americans from the coast was a matter of national security. Newspapers and radio personalities echoed these ideas, and politicians repeated them in speeches. Mayors, governors, and business leaders agreed, and so did farming interests. A lot of California's produce was grown on Japanese American farms, and West Coast farmers groups were eager to see their competition disappear. They even sent people to Washington to argue for removal. Some voices opposed these ideas, including within the FBI and other parts of the federal government, but they were shouted down or ignored. On February 19, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. It gave the Secretary of War the power to set up military areas and to expel anyone he considered a threat. By November, the West Coast had been emptied of every person with Japanese ancestry. No, there was no evidence of a massive plot by Japanese Americans on the West Coast or Hawaii. The idea that they were secretly loyal to Japan was part of a long history of anti-Asian racism. Stereotypes painted Asian Americans as foreign, not truly American. Even the law treated them differently. Asian immigrants were banned from becoming citizens because of their race. After Pearl Harbor, these stereotypes fueled a panic against Japanese Americans. They were sent to prison camps surrounded by barbed wire and armed guards. Despite harsh conditions, people set up schools, churches, and newspapers, even bands and sports teams. But they were still in prison. Some of them worked to prove their loyalty to the U.S., like when the Army formed the all-Japanese American 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Volunteers joined the unit, which went on to become the most decorated one of its size in history. Others resisted in any way they could, going on work strikes or protesting the poor conditions and food rations. Some answered no on a loyalty questionnaire, earning the name No-No Boys. They were labeled troublemakers and sent to a separate camp. Others refused to register for the draft, which could force them to serve in the military. They said they'd be happy to serve if their citizenship rights were restored first. Nearly all who refused to register were sent to federal prison. Some resisted by going to court, with four cases making it all the way to the Supreme Court. Three of them failed, including Fred Korematsu. He was arrested for refusing to report for removal. Korematsu's defense was that Order 9066 violated his constitutional right to a trial. 
But the court ruled that in wartime, the government could suspend your rights based on your ancestry. In the fourth case, Mitsuye Endo sued the government and won. She'd been fired from her job and then imprisoned with her family. Her lawyers argued that it violated the Constitution to lock up a loyal citizen without trial or charges. The Supreme Court agreed. That started the process of closing the camps, which were fully shut down by March 1946. But after years of imprisonment, people had little to return home to. Property and businesses had been taken and sold to others for almost nothing. Valuable equipment had been stolen and homes vandalized. Many found their experiences in the camps too painful to talk about, even with their children. But a new generation of Japanese Americans fought to have the injustice recognized. They achieved their goal with the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. It said incarceration had been due to racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. It formally apologized for the grave injustice and paid every survivor $20,000. The law hoped to discourage the occurrence of similar injustices and violations of civil liberties in the future. And it set aside money to educate the public about this chapter of our history. There are important lessons there for all of us.